<laughs> so, um, I first heard about Divine uh, even before I saw the movies. I knew about. I just saw the image. It was that face from Pink Flamingos with the giant eyebrows and the insane makeup. So for years I would see that image, but uh, it didn't. It wasn't until probably around college when I started to actually see the films. It started with Hairspray. That was the first one I saw on the big screen. And then I went backwards and I watched, you know, Pink Flamingos and Female Trouble and Polyester and Multiple Maniacs, and I became completely obsessed with that world. And um, I think it was probably about six or seven years ago where I had a, a, a light bulb moment yeah. where it's time to make a film about Divine. Because uh, I figured the next generation needed to know yeah. about Divine. Six or seven years yeah. from that first phone call to John Waters saying, Can I make a movie about Divine? Do I have your blessing to today? That's How would I sum up this experience? It's been a whirlwind, you know, uh, documentary, if you're going to start it, you never know if you're going to finish it, <laughs> you know, you just take a leap of faith. But I just had this feeling in my heart that uh, the film would be done. And we reached out to Divine's fans all around the world to help us make the film. So we did uh, crowdfunding and we did Kickstarter and Indiegogo and we asked all the fans to help to support us. And they did, you know, they came forward and they, Divine was so important to them. They were invested to make sure that the movie turned out well and that they could play a part in its making. Well, could there be a biopic of Divine? Could there be somebody playing Divine, yes. an actor playing Divine? The sure, there, you can be. That could happen, you know, but I, I like the real thing. There's no one like Divine. Nobody looked like that, sounded like that. Any actor playing him would be an imi a pale imitation. But could, it, could there be a movie about Divine and who could play Divine? That's a good question. It would probably have to be someone we've never seen before, you know, just coming out of nowhere and giving this amazing performance as Divine. But uh, we'll see if that uh, comes to be. Well, it, actually, Divine Story uh, lays out very classically. You know, it starts. Uh, in a place where he's not the person that he's meant to be. And as the film unfolds, you get to go step by step with him to see how he overcomes obstacles, like any film, like any scripted film, it's very similar. You know, and there's also the moments uh, where he triumphs, you know, where he has to overcome something and he triumphs. Like uh, the story of his mother, where it's set up in the beginning that they are estranged from each other, and you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know if they'll ever see each other again, and then there's a big reunion at the end. And of course, the way he died, he gave the film this tragic ending, you know. So I have to, you know, thank Divine for giving us a, a great ending for the film, even though it was horrible that he died, but he had a sense of show business and drama, and I think he probably would have appreciated the fact that the ending of the film is so ironic and you have mixed emotions because he was at the top of his game, he was the happiest he had ever been, and then, you know, he's gone like that, you know? So, not good for life, but for storytelling, it's probably a good ending, you know? Frances Milstead was Divine's mother, and you know, unlike a lot of uh, mothers of her time, she knew that Glennie was different. Mm -hmm. She knew that he was not like other boys, and she accepted him, and she protected him fiercely. You know, she 
would go to the school and yell at the principal because why are the kids beating up uh, my son, you know? So her presence in the film was so important to show that rock solid love, you know, even when they were estranged for all those years, her love for him never went away. And when they were reunited, it was a powerful, it was a powerful thing, you know, because she, she got to see her son living his dream, you know? So Francis gave this film its heart and soul and I'm so grateful that we got to interview her. She passed away a few years ago, so she never got to see the film, but she knew that it was happening, you know? And she was a very beloved figure herself. You know, she was living in uh, Florida, and she was just surrounded by all these gay guys who loved her and adored her and made her every day happy, and she marched in the gay parade, and uh, you know, she would hang out in gay bars and judge uh, divine look-alike contests and things like that. So she was a real character. So you see from the film, she was a character in her own yeah, right. You can see it. Yeah. The influence of divine on current cinema, you know, now, drag has always been part of movies, even from the silent films. You know, you Fatty Orbuckle in silent movies was in drag, you know. Uh, it's always been part of theater. It goes back to Shakespeare. I mean, it's, and it's movies like Some Like It Hot or Tootsie or things like that. But it's so interesting because Divine was never playing a man in a dress. He was always playing uh, a woman. And it's never commented on that he's a man playing a woman. He just is. So now you see movies like uh, the Tyler Perry Medea movies, you know, where it's not Tyler Perry in a dress, it's Medea. So it's interesting how now you actually do see that happening more often, but there's still movies where the guy has to go undercover in drag somehow, like, uh, I can't know, White Girls or something, I don't know, there's this movies that still use that theme, you know? But I don't know, I think Divine is very unique. The collaboration between John and Divine is very, very unique. There's never been anything like it. There never will be anything like it, you know? So, I don't know. I, I think uh, the remake of Hairspray, maybe a lot of people who saw that didn't even know that it was a remake. Yeah, didn't know that. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, so I, I hope that uh, they'll go back and, and look at those, those uh, older films. Because they're so inspiring, you know, for young people who want to make movies, they can look at what John and Divine did. It's very similar. Now they're probably making movies and put them on YouTube, you know. In the 60s, it was all about the underground, underground film. And it was just the perfect marriage of director and star. So I think, you know, today there are probably the John Waters of the future is, is making movies in the basement and uh, putting them on YouTube and we'll see what happens. We'll see 20 years from now who those people are that are going to be the icons of tomorrow. Uh, is it possible to shock today? I don't know. It feels like we've seen everything, you know? And now these films that come out of Hollywood, some of the humor in those films could have been out of a John Waters movie, you know? Uh, like something like Jackass with Johnny Knoxville, those films. There's things in those, those movies that are unbelievable and hilarious, but they're made by major studios, you know? So it's very, very mainstream. Television just deals with shock, all these reality shows, you know? But those reality shows, it seems like we're supposed to look down on those people. We're supposed to kind of make fun of those people on reality shows. I don't know how popular they are in France, but, you know, in the U.S. there's, you know, Honey Boo Boo and all this stuff that's, it's just tacky, you know, and it's, it's, it's no fun. And, and, with Divine, you're always rooting for Divine. You're never, you're never, you're always on Divine's side, and you want to see Divine triumph uh, in, in all those films. So, I don't know. I think maybe the thing that would shock the most today is just to be sincere, yes. <laughs> you know? yeah, just to so. just to be not ironic at all and sincere. I'm attracted to larger-than-life personalities. I'm attracted to people who live on the edge, and also people who are not respected maybe so much in their own lifetimes or, or, or do more respect and are actually more important than we give them credit for. And these are all people that, some of them, you know, they created these larger-than-life personas to protect themselves in some sense. Maybe not Vito Russo so much because he always was who he was, but uh, Divine, William Castle, Jack Wrangler, they created these larger than life personas to cover up some insecurities they may have had, you know, and these characters sort of help them 
achieve their goals and move through the world, you know, and I think we can all actually learn from that. My favorite John Waters movie has got to be Female Trouble. It's so hilarious and insane and ahead of its time. And you get to see Divine go through so many stages, you know. Of course, the famous scenes when she's a teenager wanting her cha-cha heels and then becoming a stripper and then becoming a mom and then, you know, and then going completely insane and shaving her head, and, you know, and being a murderess. It's, you know, it's just amazing. And it just goes on and on and on and on. And it's just, you can't believe what you're seeing. And now, you know, everybody wants to be famous even for the wrong reasons, you know, murderers and serial killers are just as famous as Brad Pitt these days, you know, so that movie really predicted a lot of the today's, today's culture, so that's probably my favorite, but I love uh, polyester, of course I love pink flamingos, I love seeing Divine uh, dressed up as Jackie Kennedy in uh, Eat Your Makeup, because, you know, the real hardcore John Waters fans even have never seen that film, they've never seen it, so we have footage of that in I Am Divine. And I it took my breath away when I saw that for the first time. I couldn't believe it because it's legendary. You know, and finally we get to see it. Spine Tingler, the William Castle story, is the first documentary I made, and it's the story of William Castle, who was a horror movie director in the 1950s. He was sort of the poor man's Alfred Hitchcock. He made very cheap movies that all had crazy gimmicks that go with the films. Like, if you went to see uh, one of his films, you had your life insured against death by fright. You actually, actually had a nurse in the theater giving you a life insurance certificate. He, one movie, he had little electric seat buzzers underneath the seats. And at one point in the movie, the seat buzzers go off and everyone goes crazy. He had skeletons flying over the, the audience that come out and behind the screen and fly over the audience. And these are movies that John Waters saw when he was a kid and he became completely obsessed with William Castle. And he's written about William Castle. So when I made the documentary, John Waters had to be in the film. So that's how I met uh, John Waters. And then uh, he, uh, we kept a friendship uh, after that. And so when it came time to make I Am Divine, he knew that the story would hopefully would be in good hands, so he trusted me to see he knew my work. That's a good question. You know, I love, I love all movies, and I, I love documentary, I love fiction films, I want to continue to make documentaries, I want to continue to make, uh, I would like to make fiction films, but for me it's all about the character, and I look at my documentaries as entertainments, you know, I, I try to make films, documentaries for people who don't necessarily go to see documentaries, I don't really see any difference in storytelling between a fiction film and a documentary film. You know, it's all just trying to provoke a response and to try to get the audience to identify with the people that they might not think they have anything in common with. You know, so I would like uh, a very conservative person to go see I Am Divine and uh, say, you know, get something out of it and identify with what Divine went through and, and learn to love Divine at the end of the film. Sure. It is too confidential. No, it's not <laughs> confidential. That's a, the next film I'm working on is called Tab Hunter Confidential, and it's about the life of a matinee idol named Tab Hunter, who was the biggest movie star, really one of the biggest in the world through the 1950s. But he had a very big secret. You know, he was living a gay life. He had to keep that secret in a very repressive time. And he was a product of Hollywood, and they were selling him as the dream date of all the teenage girls in America. And that was very far from what he really was. So we've been filming that. Uh, Tab Hunter is doing great. He's 83 years old now. And he looks, he's the best looking 83 year old I've ever seen. And he's finally, he's come out and he's ready to tell his, uh, his whole story. So we're hoping to have that done uh, this year. God, that's such a good question. What would I ask Divine? I'd like to know if he had an affair with his hairdresser, with yeah. his mother's hairdresser. 
because it's a rumor that John was still doesn't know or not whether or not he had an affair because when he was a teenager, uh, he got a job in his mother's hairdresser's salon, and John thinks he might have had an affair with the hairdresser. So I'd like to know if that's true. It's probably not a very good question to ask to oh, find, but it's good gossip, so I'd like to find that out. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right.